Hello and welcome to Two Wizards and a Mic, where a couple of old people, old people, old players try to talk about D&D and all that kind of fun stuff in a way where maybe you'll learn something. Uh, my name is Shane, and of course, to my left, right, wherever you are. I am Andrew. And it is also worth noting that this podcast is brought to you by Kwood Publishing, worldofmere.com, where you can go and buy everything that's ever been created there four or five times over. And please do. <laughs> uh, this week, we're talking about character sheets, um, which is, you'd think, a very small topic, but it's not, because you're about to find out why. Why should we learn about the character sheet. All right. So, yeah, we <laughs> thought we'd look at uh, more about character creation to give more of an overview. We've done some uh, talks about it. So what do you need? Well, to create your character, you need the basic rules, which you can either get free online, and we'll put the link below, or you can use the player's handbook or a starter set that they the main company sells. Um, it's not a linear process. There's lots of different ways that you can do this. You can even use pre-generated characters like ones from our NPC books. We have a lot of those on our site and at uh, DMs Guild. Um, the first thing we looked at as far as our videos was looking at races and classes. So we've done a bunch of videos on that. So you can either choose your race or class at the beginning and uh, races really actually are species like humans and elves and dwarves. And then classes are things like fighters and wizards and rogues. And then um, you're going to be looking at skills. And with your class, you get a choice of a number of skills, things that your character specializes in. And that list includes acrobatics, athletics, arcana, which is all about your magical knowledge, uh, deception, history, insight, intimidation, investigation, nature, perception, performance, persuasion, religion, and sleight of hand, stealth, and survival. I think I got everything. Oh, and medicine. So those, all of those skills are listed on the left side and, um, you're going to choose a number of those depending on what class you have. A very useful one is perception because it it's talking about how easy it is for your character to notice things, which is very important in the game. Another one is insight, which means you're you might notice something, but the insight is like is discovering why that's happening. And then um A lot of people like intimidation or persuasion as well to try to change uh, creatures or um, NPCs' minds. It's not; you, it doesn't work like magic, but it can help influence them. So, are there some skills that you favor, Shane? Because you've played more characters than I have. Um, it depends on the class, but essentially, when I try to be sneaky. Um, I'm doing things like making sure that my uh, skills are primarily for things like insight, for perception, and for stealth. Uh, right. Sort of the direction that I go in. Um, sometimes deception, because uh, you have that chance where, you know, if you're sneaking around and you get seen, you might have some sort of situation where you could potentially say, I'm just here because I'm the gardener. And then they're like, oh, yes, of course, the gardener. Right, right, right. And get away with, you know, whatever sneaky things I was doing. But um, I think for things like uh, I remember uh, doing a uh, a monk and I went for things like acrobatics and athletics where you were able to jump higher. You were able to do things like uh, do multi attacks uh, when while moving, stuff like that, sort of ninja like skills. Right. But um, and then, of course, also things like rangers, you want things like nature and uh, uh, survival, stuff like that. And those are kind of the directions I go in. But I mean, there have been some unique situations 
uh, where I've picked something that I didn't think I would use, but ended up using it anyway, because once you have the uh, the attributes to, to do them, um, like if you're really strong or if you have uh, a lot of resilience with constitution, then maybe you could pick something that uh, like uh, intimidation uh, right. would be better suited for stuff like that. So, yeah. But again, yeah, yeah stealth, very, very class dependent. Right. Yeah. It really depends on what class. <clears throat> stealth is a pretty common one, too. We should point out, too, just looking around the character sheet, if you just go up slightly here, that on the left are where your ability scores go strength, dexterity, constitution, et cetera. And uh, then there's a big addition war over what number you put in which box. Traditionally, you put the score in the box, which is what I would do, and then a modifier in the little um, circle. But some newer players like to put the modifier in the big box and their score in the circle. <laughs> and this okay, I'm just going to say, number goes here, modifier goes here, yeah. end of discussion, players. I mean, that's how it I always have matter. played. Yeah, so, it doesn't matter. But yeah, people do it the other way around, which yeah. I think is... I mean, it's okay, I guess, but ultimately, uh, I guess it's really a non-discussion to have. But really, there are there are rules. You know, there are some traditions that must be adhered yeah. to for for character yeah. sheets. It doesn't change the game though. So then on the top, we have a place for the character name, um, and don't choose, don't follow the example of the fifth edition adventures with naming. Um, then we have your class and level at the very top your race, your background, your alignment, your name, your like your actual name, and experience points, which most people don't note on the sheets anymore. And some people, this is how you advance in levels. So some DMs now just do advancing in levels by um, basically achievements, like um, if you rescue the princess or if you defeat the dragon, you get this. Um, but some DMs still do the traditional way where you're gaining by experience points, but a lot of people don't note it on their sheet. You can't, you can, of course. Then we have inspiration, which is when you get a little bonus from the dungeon master. Um, then proficiency bonus, which is your modifier you get as you level up. And you add that to basically most of the things that you do well. Uh, armor class. This is depending on what armor you have and your dexterity score. And then initiative is your dexterity modifier. So this is when you roll to see who goes first in combat. And um, you add this modifier, which is your, your dexterity modifier. And then there's a spot for speed, uh, your current hit points. If you have temporary hit points, this is like basically health in most video games, your hit dice, like what kind of dice do you use to roll your hit points? And all these things are mentioned in the class section of the rules. And then there's even a spot there for death saves if your character's dying. Um, so um, that's the kind of general part of that sheet. And then just to the right there, there's personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. So we talked a little bit about this before. And there's actually a section in the player's handbook that gives you lots of good examples. And you can actually, you can use those um, examples or you can make up your own character traits, personality traits, and ideals, bonds, and flaws. Personality, obviously, is pretty straightforward. These are like the quirks and details about your character specifically. I think one of my favorite parts is actually researching when I'm putting characters together, uh, finding unique ideals, bonds, flaws, and personality traits, just because there, you know, I've played so many characters that the standard ones are, you know, I've, I've done most of them at some level, right. but uh, coming up with really bizarre ones, I think is kind of fun. Um, yeah. I just wanted to show this to you here. I did just find it's a, not a great copy of it. But uh, this one here, this is the original. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. The original character sheet yeah. from back in the day. Yeah. And 
I remember spending far more time trying to draw a character rather than caring oh, about yeah. the numbers. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. Yeah, there's a box or there's an area on a lot of the old sheets where you can do a little um, picture of your character. And, yeah, I think everybody <laughs> everybody spent a lot of time trying – because a lot of us back then were young were young kids and, and oh, uh, yeah. very like... into drawing. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these were kind of fun. And then, of course, you have sheets like this, you know, like AD&D &D from uh, back in the day, second edition stuff. Yeah. This is kind of where I think you and I sort of lost a bit of interest in the game because we... Yeah, we I never saw this. Stuff, this is so. after I stopped playing. Yeah. But, uh, but they're pretty cool. I got to say that um, it's fun to actually see a lot of people's own creations of their sort of homebrew sheets because they get pretty elaborate. Oh, but yeah. As I've always said, you know, I think it's time to go back to, you know, just pen and paper because it'll be it's it's fine. Yeah, I yeah, that's definitely the way that I would lean in. There is another set for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in first edition, which was about four or five pages long. And it had uh, areas to write down details about your mount and your your lair and even your will and your enemies, and it just went on and on. It was amazing. Um, so let's give some examples of personality traits that are in the player's handbook. Sure. So one is that your character always has a plan for when things go wrong. Uh, another one, a great one, is that you're incredibly slow to trust. So that's a good, good one to role play with other, with other party members, but also with NPCs. Right. And here's a great one. I blow up at the slightest insult, and that's like, um, yeah, one of the characters that's coming in my in our newest book. Um, here's one. No I insults, Carl. Lack, sorry. <laughs> no insults, Carl. Isn't no that, insults, wasn't Carl, that one of his yeah. traits? <laughs> I'm rude to people who lack my commitment to hard work. So yeah, that, that'll so get true. you in a lot of trouble. Um, I like to talk at length about my profession. <laughs> and then there was this time where we had this event where we did this stuff and yeah. oh now i actually want to make a character like that who just won't shut up yeah oh my god that oh there oh here's yeah. another one i watch over my friends as if they were newborn pups i think i've actually selected that one for i don't i think the character's dead now but there's i know that i selected that one at some point another one a great one i was in fact raised by wolves <laughs> <laughs> um there is some humor in this book if you look hard enough if you look really hard um so ideals here is so that second um section of traits with your character so these are basically what drives your character things they believe in strongly so here's some examples yeah. They connect them to your alignment, which makes sense to me. Um, I trust that my deity will guide my actions for an acolyte background. Um, for the criminal background, I steal from the wealthy so I can help people in need. So like Robin Hood. And and that kind of rogue, that kind of character could be like actually a good character, right? Chaotic good, chaotic neutral. Another ideal um the world is in need of new ideas and bold actions. Then we have bonds, which are basically your character's connection to people, places, and events in the world. So a bond would be like, I owe my life to the priest that took me in. Um, I'm trying to pay off an old debt I owe to a generous benefactor. My instrument is my most treasured possession and it reminds me of someone I love. Hmm, that sentence could be taken more than one way. Um, I pursue my wealth to secure someone's love. So there's some bonds. And then, of course, flaws, which are self-explanatory. But and we've mentioned a few of these before. These are a lot of fun. Um, I follow orders even if I think they're wrong. <laughs> that... Right? That right there, that is the example of lawful neutral. Um, another flaw, if I'm outnumbered, I'll run from a fight. 
I can see that. Yeah, totally. And I just wanted to uh, also point out uh, sure. here, if you're looking, if uh, if you're a brand new player yeah. and you are looking at uh, the player's manual, there are a vast collection of um, different bonds and things depending on how, and suddenly I switched uh, pages. But essentially there are a lot of different um, uh, bonds and, and things like that and personality traits for different backgrounds, which I, I, is basically how they tend to organize these. But, um, you know, like things like their ideal for a criminal is, you know, honor. They don't steal from those also in the trade kind of thing. Um, anyway, sorry, keep going. I just wanted to sort of point those out. Uh, so head on over to like pages 127-ish uh, and you'll start seeing. Sure, them. yeah. Yeah, they're all mixed in, like you say, with the... the um background so another one i like keeping secrets and i won't share them with anyone <laughs> so yeah lots of choices for those and those go on the far right hand side of the character sheet and um you're also going to on a actually let's we might as well just move down before we go to the next page so then there's a place to put attacks and spell casting like your weapons that you use and the, the details about that on the left, passive perception, which is how, if you notice things automatically, then there's a place yeah. to put other things you're proficient with, like your tools and um, languages as well, equipment. Yeah, and then we should mention too, when we talk about equipment, that there are rules about how much you can carry. So the basic yes. rule, is on page 176 in the player's handbook. And it's that your carrying capacity is your strength times 15. So that's a lot that you can carry in pounds. Um, but quite a few groups, including ours, don't use that rule to make it more interesting and more realistic. We use the variant rule, which is on the same page. And that is that you're, if you carry weight in excess of five times your strength score, you are encumbered. Uh, that means your speed goes down by minus 10 feet, which is a fair bit. And if you have more weight than 10 times your strength, you're heavily encumbered. Your speed is minus 20 feet, which is a, you know really slows you down. And there's other effects as well. Um, yeah, I would definitely, definitely um, recommend the variant rule to make things more interesting and slightly realistic. Especially when you have like, I picture characters like, as we, we've touched on before, like carrying three, four or five different swords and seven shields and things like that. You know, the Skyrim problem where it's like, in reality, in d and I kind of think of characters like having to like stumble down the trail, you know, carrying all this stuff and being as loud as anything, like things clanking together and those kinds of things. So it's, it's always a good idea. Um for uh for the players to really take that into consideration because i mean if you're carrying a couple of things made of metal and they have a chance to like climb together like the dm can do things like well uh on your stealth check that you're about to do uh you'll be at disadvantage uh, disadvantage five times so pull out five dice and but that's not a thing oh it is in this game because you're carrying way too much yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you sound no like a i train think it's... going down the tracks yeah, it makes for a more fun game too, those kind of boundaries. Um, so we could go to page 127 then again, if you want in the player's handbook sure. to talk a little more in detail about backgrounds as well. So this is about, this is listed at the top of your character sheet, but it is a big part of making your character. And certain backgrounds go very naturally with certain classes. You of course don't have to do that, but that's one option. So the first background on page 127 is the Acolyte. I'm just bouncing back over there. Hang on. Sure. My yeah, and these are the things your character has done before they become an adventurer. I'm on page 127. 123, yeah. 4, 5, 6, 7. My computer is trying to catch up to my speed. Yeah, there, there we go. go. 
So there's accolade. So accolade, you're in the ser- give your life to the service of a temple in the service of a temple. So this is perfect for clerics, paladins, and monks. That's right, because you get uh, proficiencies in like religion, insight, things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have enjoyed fine food, drink, and high society among my temple's elite. Rough living grates on me. Yeah. <laughs> but what about your character, Shane? Oh, my character. Oh, nothing can shake the optimistic <laughs> attitude of that character. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. The next one is Charlatan. And there's going to be more backgrounds in the new edition in 2024. Some of those are released um, in the new documents. But these ones, as far as the player's handbook, Charlatan. So this is obviously one that matches up with um, rogues quite easily, and um, bards. I get bards as well would go very well with that. And then the opposite page is criminal, which also obviously matches up very well with rogue as well. Exactly. Hey, a tiefling. Especially yeah. when you have things like, um, I mean, the difference between that, like a charlatan and a criminal, essentially, is the charlatan could really, you know, give a rip about anybody else. But the criminal actually tends to have some weird uh, sense of honor, you know, like I'm not going to steal from another person in my group or in my, uh, you know, because that would be bad and, you know, and believing in stuff and, and, and people and yet at the same time robbing them blind when they're asleep. <laughs> yeah as long as they're not in the group as long as they're not yeah. you know, friendly to you at all that's true especially the whole idea of the thieves guild is a very structured organization so could be lawful your line actually could be lawful all right next is the entertainer so that's obviously a very good one to use with a bard very clearly and there's many options oh, yeah. there from like they even have tumblers and fire eaters <laughs> Actors, dancers. I use dancers as my routine yes. uh, for a couple of characters. You know, you can always do that, which is always fun. I've wanted to do poetry. I thought it would be kind of fun to have an entertainer who's a poet and mm-hmm. then have like to like perform poetry at some point in the game and have to like just try that on, you know, as you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. There's also the variant entertainer gladiator. So that would fit more with fighter. Even yeah. barbarian. Oh, um, totally then barbarian. we have folk hero. So that one really could be for any class, uh, and you know that almost ties into that's basically what, in many ways, what most of the characters in traditional D and D are. They are folk heroes. But yeah. this is the idea that this is more the idea of this happened before you became an adventurer with the party. So it's. Sort of like you've already been an adventurer. I trained the peasantry to use farm implements as weapons against the tyrant's soldiers. I love that. Yeah. The oh, peasants wait, actually, are sorry, revolting. I... They're what? No, they're revolting. <laughs> <laughs> I always picture like an idea or sorry, a flaw being like that guy from uh, Time Bandits. If you've ever seen Time Bandits, there's a scene oh, yeah, with yeah. Robin Hood and they have that guy who just punches all the peasants as they've been given some sort of, you know, treasure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next is Guild Artisan. So a member of a certain kind of guild, like a blacksmith or a cartographer, there's tons of examples there. So this, again, would fit with every every class. Um, maybe a bard might be the most... Uh, most, most, you know, the most connected naturally, but any class really could, this could be a background. An ideal of greed for like a baker. I'm only in it for the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the next one is Hermit. So this would be really, would line up really well with a lot of spellcasters like sorcerers, wizard. Actually, all the spellcasters, sorcerer, wizard, druid, warlock. Um, yeah, it may be cleric too. Yeah, a lot of those, it kind of fits, but it would fit a lot of the classes. Um, and and uh, I like this background a lot. 
I think course. that, uh, I mean, Hermit's definitely, I mean, I think everyone has played, when you first start, you've either played the the hero or you've played the Hermit. Everyone wants to be that person that just comes out of seclusion to go and, yeah. you know, discover things anew and eat cheese out of their pockets and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next is the noble. So to me, the paladin is the one that closest fits, especially the variant uh, of the background, the noble knight. Um, But every class obviously could have had a noble background. It would be interesting to have a noble background and be a rogue. That would be an interesting character combination, interesting build. I like... um... Nothing is more important than the other members of my family, but this group can screw themselves. Yeah, there's a lot of funny things about the noble. The flaw, I secretly believe that everyone is beneath me. (laughs) I would love to roleplay that moment in an adventure as a character, as a player, you know? Okay, okay, okay. You know what, you guys? I didn't want to say it, but you're all horrible and... You know, I've just, I'm done. I'm out. I'm going back to my mansion. In <laughs> fact, the world does revolve around me yeah, and I'm out. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, Outlander is next. This is a very archetypal adventurer. Someone in the wilderness, like a, a guide or a forester. Um, somebody who's been exiled. So this fits really well with ranger, druid, barbarian. Um, of course, all these backgrounds can be used for other classes, but those are the ones for me that come to mind right away. Yeah. I suppose warlock too. Warlock would actually work. Yeah, actually, probably it's a, it's a really decent fit. I mean, you've yeah. got these these traits and and ideals that I think would fit entirely. Especially if you're a fae, like you have a pact with some arc fae and you're and you're in a forest or somewhere in the wilderness. Oh yeah. That would work really well. Now Sage is obviously built for the wizard. Perfectly built for the wizard. Um but it would be interesting to have a clash like a sage barbarian or a sage um what else would be kind of playing off type? A sage rogue, I guess, too. Sage you know, you're a really mean, smart, knowledgeable rogue. That would be interesting. I like the uh, the discredited uh, academic. <laughs> I think that would be kind of fun. Like, no, no, really, there is this big rock flying at our, you know, our our world, and it's going to crash into us. And like, no one believes yeah. him. And then the DM's <laughs> like, "Ah, oh, you've saved the princess. You've guard. You've destroyed the evil creatures. And you all look up, and there's a large rock about to collide with you." <laughs> I told you! And then everyone yeah. dies. Yeah, that would be good. That would be really good. All right, then we move to Sailor. So again here, this really could be for any class. Uh, nothing is... Um, yeah, except for the variant of the Sailor, the Pirate, which they have here. That's obviously more a Rogue type or even a Bard, maybe. But Sailor, mm-hmm. pretty open. And uh, a good way to have a character who's from somewhere else, th- who's from somewhere else than the rest of the party, and maybe has had... A, a lot of different experiences. I like I like that background quite a bit. And especially since we were playing Salt Marsh not too long ago, and uh, I think a lot of us started out as sailors. And yeah, I think a, it makes sense of, in a, a medieval world. Most yeah. of the set, all the settlements are going to be somewhere near water, and. Yeah. Um, Usually my games, it took me after DMing for a long time, I realized that almost every session has water in it somehow. And um, even like the last two sessions with two different groups, with your group and the other group, both of them, a big part of the adventure was an underground lake. So even though you were in a subterranean area, I still had water involved. And actually both parties got to the edge of a a subterranean lake. And both parties were like, I bet you there's something in there. And they had to get across it. <laughs> yeah. And there and the was. The DM's like, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there was something in both of the lakes. Something very, very large. All right. 
Oh, uh, look, there's is... Gandalf flying through the, the roof of the cavern. Oh, great. He's back. Yeah. Soldiers. Uh, soldiers, yes. Yeah. So very, very good match for fighters and paladins. But, you know, there's other possibilities there. Maybe even a spellcaster is being enlisted in some kind of army. That would be, that wouldn't be unheard of in high fantasy. True, true. And then the last one in the current player's handbook is the urchin, uh, basically someone who grew up on the streets, really fits rogue quite well, or hermit actually. I'm just thinking right now, hermit would be would fit quite well. Uh, bard, actually, too. I could see very easily a lot of bards having that background. I like, yeah, and um, very common background. Like the outlander, the sage, the urchin, the entertainer. Those are very common, iconic archetypes in, in fantasy for the hero. You know, you don't hear as much about the acolyte or the i guess a, a noble to a noble background that's not uncommon that's basically like batman right so, i've used noble oh. probably two or three times in the past mm -hmm. you know, four or five years like i it's one that i tend to go to because it gives you a little flexibility in what kind of uh bonds and flaws you have for, for them because I mean, a lot of the default for Noble tends to be, you know, somebody who has uh, grown up with a silver spoon in their mouth and they look down on everybody where right. um, one of my characters, I just tried to flip that around to be like they, they went out into the, into the streets of the city and they tried to do things and, and stuff like that and, and tried to be better than, uh, than a lot of people they knew. Yeah, people often forget about that, especially in our current world that there are people who have means and money and who've who've uh you know been very fortunate and they actually use their their wealth or their skills for good there are quite a number yeah. of people like that and um so it's fun playing a noble like that who who's going to try to use their all the advantages they've had to actually help other people yeah all right so let's go back to the character sheet just to take a look Again, maybe flip to the next part. The This is the main character sheet. And the back of it has a few other little other details. Documents. Hang on. I need to get the other character sheet. Sure. Uh, this one, I think, is this one here. There yeah. So this place is where you can uh, have your age, your height, your weight. And we've talked about why that's actually important in the game. That can that can be very important if someone um, throws something over your character's head, if they're shorter, or if there's a certain weight that you are, that maybe you've triggered a trap or someone's trying to throw you. And then there are some things about your appearance, your eyes, your skin color, your hair. And a little there's a place there actually just like old school D&D &D, to have a little portrait if you want. <laughs> right in here. Yeah, and they have places where you can list your alliances, your your appearance, and what's below that. I haven't looked at this one for a while. Uh, additional features. Oh, yeah, so, so just so additional features. There's a place for equipment at the very bottom, if it doesn't fit on the front of the character sheet. And what's on the what's that last left chart supposed to be? Uh, the backstory. Oh, your backstory. Yeah. So this is where you can give more detail, and then this the other. Part of the char the next character sheet is one that just is used for spellcasters, and we're going to actually talk about spellcasting in our next talk about the mechanics of it and give some examples. So this is where you list your spells and your your modifier to attack with spells and your difficulty class uh, with how challenging your spells are. And yeah, that's those are the basic character sheets. Yeah, they're pretty. I mean, the the current five uh, version of the of the sheet is to me probably. I mean, as a lot of fifth edition, uh, a lot of stuff got refined to the point where the game was. You're like, why has this not been here before? Yeah. Um, 
you know, it's not perfect in any way, but it's as perfect as it's ever been. Um, because when I came back to playing D and D when fifth edition was out, um, I was actually started, I started thinking about playing and started playing. Um, I think just as the fifth edition came out, um, and there was a lot of, of transition, uh, for all of the, uh, role-playing games at the time like i i started playing a couple of their different uh versions of role-playing uh cthulhu and and uh, a couple other ones but uh when i did come back to to you know the granddaddy game um you know it it was such a different beast from you know first second i as i, I skipped actually i skipped second third and fourth um but uh you know kind of uh was able to pick it up really fast, which was the, the thing that surprised me was I was able to look at a character sheet, know exactly what it was, even though I hadn't really looked at one for a while and thought, oh, well, of course. And, you, oh, what is this different? What is this passive thing? What is this thing over here? But it wasn't like, my God, what am I looking at? It's like Greek all over the place. So, you know, a lot of those core things that that uh, were from the very beginning have been you know modified and changed but they're still the same if that makes sense at least the way i look at it um there's definitely benefits to some things that have been lost i think that maybe you should come back but um i don't know how have you been with uh when you returned to the game uh what was your sort of initial reaction at well basically all of it but specifically the sheets yeah, very similar. We both we both skipped two, three, four. Went and did life, and I didn't think I'd ever come back to the game. But um, yeah, I was reading. I've said this before. Reading the book of Dice and Men. Um, yeah. A book about the history of D and D, and then it, I started thinking about it, and then realized it'd be much easier to get groups together with the internet. So yeah, the same thing happened. I think the five E rules, and like you said, the character sheets. They're so efficient, so simple. They really got a lot of the core part of the game. And it's, I heard another person actually on a DD d video today say again, how complicated it is. It's not complicated. I don't know who, who thinks it's complicated because I know um, a lot of five to 10 year olds who are playing it. And this is the easiest, simplest, clearest version of the game ever. Um, we were playing a much more complicated version in the late 70s uh, with Thaco and everything. And a lot of late young kids could play it no problem. So it's not complicated. There's a few little tweaks with rules. And once you have a lot of spells as a spellcaster, it can get more complicated. Yeah. But the basic game is quite simple. And uh, the character sheet shows you that it's quite simple what everything is for the most part. And yeah, I think they well, did the a really good job. It, Over... Sorry? Well, well, I was just going to say the best part about it as well is that D&D is not a game to be learned on your own. It's it's a game about other people, like being with other people and hanging out and 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 learning a, a game together kind of thing or being taught, which is even more I think to the to the reality of how people get into the game is somebody says, "Hey, have you ever played?" Like, oh no, I've never played. Oh, you come on over on Saturday. We're getting a bunch of people together. We're going to do the thing, and just being able to sort of learn from osmosis, you know, just being around people who are playing, and and uh, it's not a game about looking at the player's manual, memorizing the whole thing. It's about looking at the player's manual, getting a key on A for like putting your character together. And then when you're playing, it's a lot easier, especially when it's not pressure driven, like there's not perfectionists in the in the thing, as it were, polishing their armor. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, those kinds of players that are very rigid about the rules and very rigid about those kinds of things. And and I I've, in my experience, when the rules are being followed with like a laser focus, uh, the storytelling goes out the window and it just becomes boring. It just becomes mm -hmm. about, oh, well, you need to roll that. Oh, you forgot that dice. No, no, you have to roll yeah. that one instead. Yeah. And it's like, ah, oh, God, okay. Uh, I, I have other things to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to go wash my hair. Thanks. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, when you're creating the character and you're going over the sheet, I mean, that is kind of the, I mean, the whole thing is fun, but 
if you were to think about it from like the singular perspective of one person creating a character and being like, okay, I'm going to do this and be kind of cool. And these are some cool ideas that I have for that. I mean, that just, it brings joy to me just to do that and then turn around and be like, this character is going to be playing in this game. And then suddenly the DM's like, that's kind of awesome. And I see the, on your sheet, that you've had these things and these flaws and these traits. Uh, how about I'm going to, maybe I'm going to uh, suddenly, uh, you know, something walks into this, into the scene where, your character's afraid of it or excited by it or whatever, or it's their parents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. And like you Which say, like. most, most groups are really good about teaching pe people who are new to the game and helping them along. And you learn really just, just start playing with a group who, you know, at least there, as long as there's one person who, you know, who knows the rules pretty well, who's got it kind of figured out, then everyone else can kind of go along for the ride. It's, it's not that oh, exactly. challenging. I think, you know, making the game, the things that they've lost, they've made it, it's not as challenging overall because the player characters are so strong. So as a DM, I would always try to amp up the challenge of make it a little more difficult. And some in some ways, it's the magic items that are overpowered. So yeah. I kind of hold back on some of those certain items till later levels, especially ones that help you fly or um, there's there's a lot of ones that are I think are kind of game breaking at early levels, and so I I wait I hold those back as much as possible, and um, I think then also the traditional theme of a heroic adventure I think that is being lost to a certain degree which is the core of the game, so yeah. I think making it challenging and then having that core heroic adventure i think those parts of the game have sort of been left behind a bit and it's i think a game it's better if those are included i in saying that i know millions of people play the game around the world and obviously everybody has their own group and their own table and they can do what they like well it, it's like the one and only time that i played a game called uh world of warcraft and I was introduced to the game. Uh, I was able to play for a free over a weekend or something. This is probably, I want to say, 10 years ago now. And uh, I was able to, so I, so I had somebody that I knew that was really excited about the game. I got into it. But their version of the game was all about role play. So it was basically characters that set a lot of the, at least in the the experience that I had was I arrived at some town uh, there were a bunch of people that were running stores and they had people running around that were you know like their minions like I need more of this and they would go out and collect it and bring it back and and it was like this ultra pseudo realistic sort of living in this game and I'm sitting around going but there are skeletons like over there like walking through the forest nearby like shouldn't we go and like murder them or something <laughs> But uh, I never went back. It was the only time I ever played. I'm like, this game yeah. is boring. I learned yeah. later on that that's actually not. It was just that dude that I knew that played a certain way and only logged right. into a server that played a certain way. And I mean, yeah, it, that kind of stuff just breaks the game all over the place. And when you're trying to have fun, what's the point? I mean, as, yeah, as that, you and I at that point, like, you know, somebody asked that this. Yeah, it's just a game. <clears throat> somebody asked that this week on Twitter because there was this discussion about some players now who don't want their characters to die. And um, I said, well, that's that's just not the game. That was my comment. That's part of the game. And somebody said, well, isn't it true that, again, there are millions of people and people have lots of different tables and people can play the way they want? And of course, that's true. At the same time, if you change the game so much that it's a different game, maybe you don't want to be playing D&D. Maybe you want to invent a different game. You know? Yeah. I mean, the uh, fact and that's that what I've seen if there's no risk, degree, yeah, 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 there's no risk. Why? Like, why yeah. would you play a game ever? Like, there's, there's, like, board games. You have risk of certain. You know, like Monopoly is a perfect example. Playing D and D, death of your character, or yeah. doing something that causes the death of another character. Like, um, yeah. you know, a donkey, perfect example, right? Like right. the whole situation where we had a character that that cast a spell that was quite powerful. And then suddenly the uh, one of the lead characters, one of the lead NPCs, 
I think it was their spouse died. Was that right? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, the magical donkey's wife died. Yeah. So having that happen, you know, to people that had played with that character before, who knew that, you know, in previous sessions, that would be quite impactful. Like, how did this happen? Well, it's how the dice rolled. Would you have killed off the character just in adventure? Probably not, because the character was enjoyable and kind of fun. But stuff happens. Like dice rolls are bad uh yeah you sent me an audio clip of of the dual death that we had a couple years ago where yeah. we had two natural ones like right after the other like that kind of stuff just happens and you have to kind of roll with it and the whole idea and the concept of characters just can't die i mean i guess sure maybe if you're like i don't know everyone's a celestial and your adventure is taking place in heaven or something and maybe that's a thing and the only fear of you know death is like you get tossed out of heaven or something and but I don't know. That just kind of makes it really boring. Like it just, there's, if there's no risk, then stuff going wrong is kind of awesome because, yeah. you know, we have all these players that come into the game that have created characters that have these sort of preconceived notions of how adventures should work. And the DM is there to be like, well, okay. I, I can see the vision you have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I have this uh, 120 sided dice that's going to tell us exactly what to do. Oh, let me look at the table. Uh, you all die of dysentery. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why that's why another good thing they did add in into fifth edition was the flaws. And those are fun to role play um, and to have as a major part of your character. It makes your character more realistic, more human, whether we're playing a human or not, we are humans yeah. and more relatable. And, uh, you know, if you have an ability score that's really low, I think in our group, we decided, you know, we kind of said if it's below seven, I think you get to re-roll one time. But yeah. it is fun to have, you know, weaknesses and, you know, flaws in the character. And that can come in this game from your ability score, maybe your you know, you got a seven intelligence, which is really low intelligence. And uh, you can barely figure out where the where the party's lair is and you get lost all the time. Or maybe your flaw is something just, you know, uh, quite, um, you know, that actually has consequences. Like you, you keep talking about a character, a player in our group whose character had to fight any undead they knew about and yeah. so it was basically doing a leroy jenkins every time they were undead around or even if somebody's mentioned you know in the next town like you know two days from here i saw i think i saw a skeleton walking around the street then she's like okay we're going <laughs> gotta go take care of that business yeah you, you gotta know. deal with that right away so I remember, I think that one of the first things happens was, happened was you heard there was a problem in a graveyard nearby and she like just raced. Oh yeah. <laughs> was just like, oh, just I can't bolted. wait to get I'm out. There. I gotta go to the thing. Oh, it's just down yeah. the street. Okay, cool. I'll be right. I'll, I'll, I'm yeah, gonna go kill gone. everything and I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those flaws and those, you know, those parts and quirks of your character, it makes the game so fun. And again, you know, that's just, that's the whole point because if, if we're not trying to have fun, then at a game like this, then, then what are we doing? Exactly. <laughs> Why, what is yeah. the, who another, cares at the end of the day? Another great flaw was another player in our regular group who we were in the underdark and he was a cleric, but he, he looked down on everybody else. And he definitely thought he was superior and he went crazy in the underdark and we rolled on a table even to check. There are madness tables in the dungeon master's guide. You can of course yeah. do your own thing, but we rolled on the table and I, I looked, I was the only one who could see it. And it just says you turn invisible. Oh no. It says you believe you turned invisible and you won't believe anybody else. Right. So I give this note because we were playing in person at that time. Still, I gave a note to the player that said that. And so he's, you know, and Demogorgon had just come out of an under underground lake, which is supposed to be a, a minor uh, encounter to kind of scare the party away because no one should be fighting them, even though 
you might have oh, been yeah. 10 or 12th level, but Demogorgon is still not a good not a good idea to fight. And everybody else is taking off and saying, come with us, come with us. And he's like, it's okay. He can't see me. <laughs> it's okay. I'll be fine. He'll never find me. And Demogorgon just like picked him up and just like destroyed him in like one or two turns. Like, <laughs> And even <laughs> though the player was sad to lose their character, it was such a funny moment and such an epic way to go. Um, it's part of the game. You know, we sound like broken records with reminding people that this is just a game because we know there are people out there that take it so seriously <laughs> that they forget to have fun. And I just it weirds me out sometimes where we have to remind people that it's okay. People can interpret the rules a different way. And if you actually read the book, uh, or the books that they actually have like in the, the DM's guide and in the player's manual, they actually have like, these are the rules. But, you know, if, if you're a DM or you want to, you know, ignore or change or modify or just make up a new rule, sure. As long as you're having fun, like, there you go. You know, it's... it's yeah. Uh, I think as long as you don't get, change the game too much again, you know, uh, otherwise it's another it's not really the same game anymore but i think there's lots of homebrew rules that groups you know they add to their personal group their home group um yeah and i think some of that is great and then you know the other thing about keeping true to most of the rules rules is written is that yeah. players know the consistency and the game is balanced and if you have a new yeah. player come into the group now they can you know, if you've kept most of the rules and the core of the game, then they can easily play. If you've got 50 homebrew rules and, and uh, you know, you've completely changed it, that becomes more challenging. Yeah. It's something that is a... Uh, I'm going to say it again. It's something that keeps us all having fun with the game. I mean, hell. Why do I feel like we're we we have to remind people all the time? I just find that oh, I have no problem strange. with someone reminding me that it's okay to have fun. Sometimes everybody, we all forget that at times or get overly serious with something. It happens, especially these days, right? How many times do we have uh, pandemics and heat domes and forest fires and you know? Yeah. I mean, we gotta, it's, we gotta, like, to, uh, all that teaches us to enjoy every day, one, one day at a time, one moment at a time. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's, uh, you know, you find yourself, uh, flying off the, I'm trying to think of a character death that I had recently. Actually, did they have a character like sacrifice themselves? Yeah. I had a character jumped into lava or something. Yeah. Um, you did at some point. Yeah. That, cause it was yeah. like a, they required a sacrifice and yeah uh you reminded the our our group that there was something about it that we needed to do and it twigged oh yeah of course we have somebody has to die i think my character was a folk hero with like you know the the health of the party is the most important thing and it was just like i got yeah. it dives in and you know the world yeah uh, i think that was when you survive. were dealing with the lich in a temple underground if i remember correctly yeah something yeah. like that it was kind of yeah it was it was exactly that kind of stuff but uh yeah ah well all right we've been going for a while so let's call it there boys and girls uh thank you yeah. all for uh coming by and checking us out um as always of course uh this podcast is brought to you by kwood publishing at the world of, or at world of .com. is there any uh kickstarter updates any uh stuff you want to mention yeah just quickly that um the art is completely finished for the new book, Bayland 2, and uh, the nice. final edits are done. So now we're waiting just to do the last part of the layout. And um, yeah, so the PDF should be coming fairly soon. And um, that is um, our newest book in the Monster series. If you look at our website, you can actually still pre-order it. It's our biggest book yet. And um it is the sequel to our Monsters of Feyland book. And then also to mention next time, we'll be talking about spellcasting. We haven't talked about that 
um, at all, really. Talk about spell casting mechanics yeah. and um, how how that is in like many things in fifth edition, they've simplified it and it's not that complicated. Yeah, exactly. It's probably the hardest thing that I always run into. But uh, we'll go into some detail next week, and I think I'm going to learn a lot because uh, I tend not to be a spellcaster, but maybe that's because I'm afraid of spells. But who knows? Uh, but always, thank you again, Andrew, and thank you all for watching. Everything is down in the description down below. And, of course, we'll see you next week. Thank you so Thanks, much. Shane. Later.